Welcome, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Martini, Candid Conversations with a Twist. My name is Gus, and I'm Mary Rentals Director of Business Development for North America. And I've been with the Airy family now for over 17 years and honored to be your host today. At Airy Rental, our goal is to equip you, the filmmaker, with the most inspiring image technology in the world. Our services cross borders and continents with a network of facilities in North America, Europe, and the UK, where we bring you first-class camera, lighting, and grip equipment, wherever you may be. Our team is there to welcome you with friendly expertise, personalized solutions, and we value the relationships that we've built on trust. As a friendly reminder, please send us your questions via the Q&A tab, and we'll get to as many of those as possible today. And uh, we are very fortunate to have with us the very talented Adam Newport Barra. Adam was, uh, is a cinematographer born and bred in the woods of Oregon. And uh, since earning his film degree at NYU, Adam has lensed a number of celebrated features, television episodes, documentaries, shorts, commercials, and music videos. His work is screened at festivals around the world, including the Sundance Festival, New York Film Festival, South by Southwest, Telluride, Cannes, Toronto, Tribeca, and Camera Hommage. His recent collaboration with director Joe Talbot won special jury prize for creative collaboration at the 2019 Sundance Film Festival. Adam's projects as cinematographer include Creative Control, Burn Country, Barry, Last Black Man in San Francisco, and the last two episodes of Euphoria, season one. Welcome, Adam, and thank you for taking the time to be with us today. It's great to see you. Thanks, Gus. Good to see you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. No worries. I would love to hear how you found yourself um, becoming a filmmaker. What was it that uh, inspired you? Um, I always loved storytelling, um, and I grew up with my camera, with my uh, parents, like, high eight camera, uh, just kind of messing around all the time. Um, and I would just kind of steal it and run off into the woods or take it snowboarding or skateboarding and just start filming stuff. And I don't know, I just really, really loved using a camera and I got into still photography, um, got more into skateboarding. And, you know, as time went on, I started to uh, realize how powerful filmmaking was. You know, I was making skate videos for my friends and just seeing their reaction when I cut them together was so gratifying that I just kept doing it and I uh, just kind of went from there. And when I went to NYU, I realized that I was a little bit more experienced with cameras than some of my colleagues. So I ended up shooting all my buddies' films and just kind of fell into cinematography. <laughs> Very cool. Was there was there a particular film or TV show or something you were watching at an early age that really kind of like wowed you and said, wow, this is what I want to do. This is really cool. Um, not really. I mean, it was really a progression of just making things that uh, really got me into filmmaking. You know, I was raised on a lot of Indiana Jones and, uh, you know, that kind of like poppy, like thriller action movie stuff that uh young kids love so you know i love the movies just as well as anyone else but i wasn't really a film nerd and a film buff and i think when i went to nyu i was sort of humbled by how much knowledge everyone else in my class had and that's when i kind of started to dig in and really start watching movies and start doing my research um and started discovering stuff that got me really excited about uh filmmaking hmm. and the look that you know you've created in your projects is is very unique and it's very you and I've and you've been so kind to share still images with me over the last couple of years and uh, mm -hmm. sending me stuff and I think it's um, it, it's beautiful how you capture the world and I'm interested in hearing about you know is there other artists painters or still photographers anybody that you kind of cling to and said oh that's interesting I want to see what I can do with that but take it further was there somebody that inspired you like that? Um I think the most inspiring sort of person in my life, as far as uh, people I look up to is Robbie Mueller, the cinematographer, the late cinematographer, um, Dutch cinematographer, uh, who I didn't really discover until I was older and you know, until I was in college. And once I started seeing his films, I was just so floored with how he saw the world and how he was able to 
creates so much with so little. You know, a lot of his most incredible work is on tiny little indie movies, you know, in the 70s and 80s. And uh, I just was really, really impressed with um, how he was able to carry his sort of touch and his vision, but make it fresh every time with every director. And, you know, I think that's something I really admire and try to strive for is that I don't, I don't ever really want to be considered to have a specific aesthetic that people hire me for. I want to be hired for my working style and the way I collaborate with the director and I'm able to like bring out their vision. And I think Robbie was always able to do that, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, he is just, he's sort of a master that I've always looked up to. Yeah. Uh, his work is beautiful. It's very cool. <laughs> Um, you've been really kind and you've shared with us a lot of detailed, um, images and, and pre-production work on your latest feature, Last Black Man in San Francisco. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to spending the next couple of minutes of, to dig in and talk about that, if that's cool. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, yeah, totally. so I'd, I'd like to hear your story about, you know, how did you, how did this project come to you? What drew you to it? And how did you go about developing the look for this film? Um, so I first discovered the project through my agent, Ann Murphy at ICM. Uh, she was talking about Joe, the director, um, talking about his short film that had played at Sundance a couple years before called American Paradise, uh, which I watched and immediately fell in love with. And I could just tell that Joe was a really unique singular voice and someone that I was just sort of desperate to work with. Um, just the way he worked with cinematography and production design and acting and performance. Like he was just really, um, I could tell he had a voice and he had something to say. Uh, so the next like six months to a year was me basically trying to find any way to uh, get in touch with Joe and uh, track him down and, and did an incredible job kind of linking me up with him. And we had a lot of conversations about the film. Um, and Joe had only made one short film prior, but you know, he really had a unique vision for his film. And I think, more than anything, he understood the tone of his film. And he was able to, able to relay that really beautifully to me. And I was able to take that and sort of interpret it into something more visual, you know? And we spent a lot of time looking at photographs, talking about films, talking about paintings, things like that, that uh, inspired us. But at, at the same token, it was also just about spending time together and hanging out with Joe, hanging out with Jimmy, the lead actor, walking the city with them, hearing their stories. You know, I think that's a really important part of it is, you know, you can spend a lot of time looking at reference imagery and talking about the look of a film, but what's really important is understanding the tone and the feel uh, and just getting to know all the other creators uh, within the film really just inspired me and helped me, you know, realize Joe's vision for the movie. Mm -hmm. And this was all shot on location in and around San Francisco? It was, yeah. Um, you know, we shot it on a tiny budget, a very, very indie streamlined budget. And so, you know, we couldn't build any of the sets or anything. We were always on location. Um, and we found some incredible locations, but San Francisco is a challenging city to shoot in. So it made, you know, some of the best locations were some of the most impossible to shoot in. So it was, every day was an insane challenge. <laughs> I'd like to hear about that because I've heard from others too that that is logistically a very challenging city to shoot in. So um, can you yeah. talk about, I've heard stories about the locations and I'd love to hear you have you share those. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's funny. I mean, the movie is about gentrification. It's about the city changing. It's about, uh, you know, a new class of people kind of coming in without regard for the history of the city or the people that, you know, built that city. And mm -hmm. so i you know, we discovered there is this sort of irreverence towards the history of the city that a lot of newcomers and gentrifiers have. So, you know, we'd find these incredible locations and the owners would be like, fuck you, I bought this house, get off my property. And it was a lot of that. It was a lot of trying to convince people to shoot, you know, at their house, in their location, in their yard, things like that, that you know, normally in another city, people will be excited for you to be there. But I think there's just, it just felt like there was a lot of entitlement in San Francisco and a lot of, uh, you know, sort of ownership. That being said, like, there's still this incredible energy and community in San Francisco that pervades most of it. It's just, you know, I found that there is really, there, there's just more challenges and there's, there's more personalities to deal with. And, uh, you know, San Francisco is a very, like, compact, tightly wound city. So there was a lot of fitting into tight spaces, trying to figure out where to park trucks, where to put gear, um, you know? So it was just, it, it was, uh, there was a challenge every day. Um, and also one thing that was really wild was that the city is just being expanded and built 
so quickly that, you know, we'd be shooting at one location, leave it, realize we wanted to pick something up and go back there. And by the time we went back, it had either been demolished or things had been built around it or it had been refurbished. I mean, the house um, that Montgomery's grandfather lives in, where Danny Glover lives in, um, that house uh, was surrounded by green fields and it was right on the water, right? You know, when we first started shooting and we were scouting and it was a perfect location. By the time we finished, there were huge condos built on either side of that house. And the view of the water was completely destroyed by a fence. And uh, they had actually, that field and that harbor and that dock that we shot on was actually chained off because they had finally released the data that that water was so toxic from, you know, whatever oh. pollution had been there years ago that like no one was even supposed to be close to there. <laughs> I'm probably not supposed to be talking about this, but uh, <laughs> it, it turned out to be an insane safety risk. Uh, so, you know, the city was just changing so rapidly that we really had to keep up with it. Um, but at the same time, it felt very vindicating that we were telling a story that was very modern and very pressing. <laughs> so in this film, you, you talked about using a lot of practical locations, but also depending on uh, the time of day, using certain light coming in mm -hmm. from the sun as well in those locations. And totally. um, so I'd love to hear about how you, working with such a small budget, um, we're able to light this because this film, the lighting in this film is amazing and um, getting shafts of light coming through the windows and certain scenes and love to hear how you were able to achieve that. Yeah, it was kind of a scheduling nightmare, but I, you know, what I did was spend a ton of time in our location, you know, during prep, I had a very short prep period, but any free time I had, I just went and like spent time in our locations and took a lot of photographs and kind of mapped out where the sun would be. Um, the house, the main house we shot in was owned by this older gentleman who was really uh, supportive of the film and basically gave us a key to the house. And I would show up at random times of the day and just sit in the living room and, you know, I'd be doing work, prep work, but I'd also be taking photos and just kind of studying where, where the light was and how, you know, which rooms looked the best at which times of day. And then from there, I would take that research that I did and work with the AD to sort of schedule scenes as, you know, so that they would fit the right time of day. Um, and uh, sometimes we would also just see something amazing and just stop what we were doing, take the camera, take the actors and just shoot the beautiful light whenever we could. And that's the beauty of like a smaller nimble film is that we could do things like that. Nice. Um, and, and this uh, is this yeah. is the lookbook that you shared with us. So I yeah, see some so, of <laughs> yeah, this is a lot of Robbie Mueller's work in here. Yeah. Um, this is the initial lookbook that I shared with Joe uh, on our first meeting. And this is something I do with every film um, whenever I meet on them. You know, I try to take my first impressions from the script and just put together sort of a collage of images that come to mind. Um, and I really enjoy this period because this is sort of the dreaming phase. And I always i am pretty transparent with the directors that this isn't how I think they should shoot their film, but rather the things that sort of bubbled to the surface as I was reading. Um, and it's a great way to sort of take the temperature of a, a working relationship, you know, to see what they respond to. Uh, and Joe really responded to a lot of these images. And I think that's part of why we ended up working together. Nice. So you do this prior to location scouting, you're, you're looking at these images and sharing this with the director and then yeah, I mean, I do this before I'm even hired on the film. This is, oh, you know, okay. I, wow. I did this, I did this as sort of a pitch to get hired on the film, um, amongst uh, many other things. And then I made more lookbooks on top of this that were a little bit more specific. But um, this is just sort of to get a general tone of, you know, what inspired me. And then from there, once I'm hired and once I'm working with Joe, then we really dig in, you know, and I say, okay, tell me what, tell me what really, what you really respond to versus what you respond to less. Let's talk about lighting and for composition and, you know, things like that camera movement. And so from there, then I kind of hone in a more detailed lookbook um, that's a lot more specific. And that's something that I can use to communicate with a production designer, with wardrobe, with my gaffer, key grip, AC, all my crew, so that they sort of understand the more cohesive vision of what I'm trying to do. And I think that's always really important is that, you know, everyone on set is only as good as you allow them to be in a way, you know, you have to set up everyone for success. And I try to do that as much as possible. I find that like, you know, being on set, you kind of carry, you know, as a DP or director, department key, you sort of carry the weight of the world on your shoulders. But if you're able to empower your crew, you end up 
with something so much more magical than you could imagine. You know, it's everyone who works on a film set is there for a reason. There isn't a single person on a film set who is just there because they need a job. Everyone is there because they believe in filmmaking. So I, I expect everyone in my crew to have ideas down to, you know, the loader, the grip, the everybody, like everyone's going to bring something to it. And the more you arm them with ideas and your vision and set them up for success, the more you're going to get out of it. Nice. There's, um, there's a question coming in from the audience about still photography. I know you're referencing a lot of images from motion pictures here. Do mm -hmm. you find yourself looking at specific still photographers lately that you use for these lookbooks and such? Yeah, totally. Like here, this is a, if you stop here, the, the photo on the left is a, a Nan Golden photo. I love her work um, just because I think there's like kind of a sweet spot in photography where, you know, the color, the film stocks were incredible. I love that red. I love the flash. Um, Nan Golden has always been a reference because I love her use of color and lighting uh, and composition. It's just so spontaneous yet. So it's so spontaneous and fluid yet it's so composed and so natural and so real you know it's this has this heightened realism to it um there are so many photographers that i'm inspired by I, I have a hard time like coming up with the list i mean i love saul Leiter. i love uh philip lorca de Sorcia. i love uh i don't know who else do i have on my uh um let's see <laughs> i don't know uh yeah, there's just there's as long as we don't wake up a dog, we're good. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, I, I tend to go down rabbit holes and I really enjoy that. Uh, you know, I'll find a photographer I like. Um, and then like, you know, like Stephen Shore or William Magelston, and then like as I'm searching through their photos, I see people who do something similar and I venture down that that road. You know, I'm I'm not precious to one particular photographer, you know. I, I really enjoy just kind of meandering through and finding different inspirations mm. and in regards to tools uh, i'm curious to hear your thoughts on do you do you choose to experiment and try different tools for different projects do you do a lot of testing or you do you have kind of a very specific uh palette that you work with um on each film i, I love experimenting i think i you know for me i definitely have things i fall back on and things i'm comfortable with um, but, you know, I try to take risks and try new things every time I think I create a new project. Um, so I try to shoot tests as much as possible. It's really tough. You know, I think especially right now, the industry is evolving so rapidly and projects are happening so quickly that I often find that I'm thrown into a project really late in the game um, and I'm not allowed a lot of testing. Uh, and that's just kind of where I'm at in my career. And I'm hoping that as I take on bigger projects, I'll have more time and resources to, to do tests. But like for last black man, we had, you know, a day where I was able to steal the actors and get a camera um, and shoot some tests really quickly, ship them off to our colorist, Damien. And he was able to build a lot for the camera that we could, you know, view the, view the image through. But uh, we didn't get like, we didn't, didn't get time to do extensive testing. So I've kind of had to rely on instincts and gut and just scouting a lot of the time. And then also just like experimenting and testing on set, which is often terrifying, but you know, it's, it's the best proving ground <laughs> trial by fire. <laughs> and with your crew, do you, is there, is there a particular crew that you bring with you uh, no matter where you go uh, or do you mm, work with a different crew? I wish. Um, but at the same time, I'm also really blessed to have found really great crew in every, every city I've worked in. Um, just because of the nature of most of my projects, I, we, you know, we end up having to hire locally. Um, and so it's, it's intimidating. I mean, when I went to San Francisco, I had worked there a couple of times, but I really didn't know that many people. And I had to spend a lot of time um, interviewing people and kind of cross, you know, making calls and reference calls to figure out my crew because, you know, the energy of a crew is really important for me. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I was so lucky to find just like probably the best crew I could have imagined in San Francisco. Um, and it was, you know, the, the thing that's really cool about hiring a local crew is that they are local and that they understand the city and they know it. And, you know, it's really special to become a part of their family and, and sort of be welcomed into their world. I think that's really magical and really kind of important. Mm. And what so what what were the qualities you looked at when you when you're hiring a crew? You said something about the energy. Um, yeah. I'd like to hear what else. Attitude and vibe is so important. I think everyone, you know, for me at this, at the point that I, I feel like I'm at in my career, 
I kind of expect and trust that everyone is technically proficient. Um, everyone knows how to do their job. It's just a matter of how you carry yourself on set and the energy that you create. Because, uh, you know, and that's something that I've had to learn over my career is that I need to bring a certain energy to set. And I kind of expect everyone else to bring a similar energy to set that's positive and like reinforcing and supportive. Uh, filmmaking is really hard and really exhausting and it's really easy to let it get the better of you. And especially as a DP, I think a lot of DPs struggle with this like idea of ego and this idea of like the world sort of revolving around them. And I'm, I was super guilty of that coming out of film school. And, you know, I thought I was hot shit and like that I was the most important person on set. And, you know, that if I was upset, I could be upset and let everyone know I was upset. And we said that would, you know, we'd figure out a way to solve it, but that's just not how things work. And you really have to be sensitive to, um, the tone you set on, you know, around other people, because it's just, it creates, creating the right environment is just crucial. Um, and so I just look for, I look for crew that I want to spend time with. I know that I'm going to be spending 12 plus hours a day with them and that's really important. Yeah. Very nice. And uh, there's a there's a question here coming in about um, specifically about lighting and uh, about gelling and if mm -hmm. there's uh, particular gels, especially on Last Black Man, that mm -hmm. you found you needed to uh, go to. Not really. Know. I think um, we did use we use a lot of like sodium vapor gels. Um, I don't know exactly which ones we did. We did some tests on some of the different sodium vapor gels for a lot of the night scenes. Um, but I'm like, I'm not technically that proficient with gels. I kind of just look at stuff and figure out what I like and then tell the gaffer that's what I like and they remember it. Um, I should be better at remembering the numbers and whatnot, but, uh, we did a lot with the sodium vapor, but we also used practical fixtures to, to get the most accurate, uh, color for that light. Um, other than that, we didn't use a lot of colored gels. We used a lot of, um, sky panels and RGB lighting when we wanted to create colored lighting. There's a few scenes, um, there's one in the real, realtor's office where there's like really bright green that's um, motivated off the neon. I think we did use a primary green gel, probably like a, one of the Storaro colored gels for that. Um, and we used a sodium vapor gel to complement and contrast that. But uh, yeah, it's interesting to see how the, you know, the film world is kind of veering away from gels. And I'm honestly kind of okay with that because it's so insanely wasteful and it's just like mm. the amount of plastic that's used and then thrown away is, is it kind of really bums me out. So I'm, I'm totally, I'm totally game for using led RGB color. It's just difficult because I love the color of Fresnel. I love the quality of Fresnel lighting that comes from chunks and lights. And I feel like led lights aren't quite to that quality level yet. Yeah, I was gonna, that's exactly what I was going to ask you next was, you know, in the lighting world, what tools are just not there yet that you're hoping for? And uh, I think that answers that question the stronger. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I think for me, what I'm searching for is like the next step in LED technology that's um, a little bit more robust and a little bit uh, more unique. I find that like, you know, the sky panels and all the, a lot of the area, Airy lights are great, um, but I feel like it, it's funny. I feel like the, tech, the evolution of technology has actually informed cinematography in a way that's kind of strange. You know, it's like the look has been determined by the technology, which, which really shouldn't be that way. Like I, I find there's much more soft light happening right now, a lot more like sourcey light happening. Um, so I'm excited to see what LED technology can provide that's more like Fresnel lighting or hard lighting, which obviously stuff exists and there's some amazing stuff at the digital spot. Nick stuff is, is really interesting, but um, I think there's a lot, a long ways to go there. Mm. So one of the other things you shared with us was kind of a breakdown of the script and the shots mm -hmm. and uh, how you organize that and communicate that to your crew. And I thought this was really really amazing and i know my colleagues were blown away by it as well so this is kind of fun mm -hmm. to go through <laughs> yeah i mean this is something i've found really useful for me i'm kind of ocd so this kind of this just this comes at a point in my preparation process where i've sort of figured everything out and i just want to compile the information um if you stay on this page for a second i can kind of walk you through it um basically what i do is create a pdf bible that uh every single page relates to a scene number um, and I try to keep it really organized so that page one is scene one, page two is scene two. I never, I never go beyond 
multiple, I never create multiple pages for one scene. That's why it's so crammed, but it's really nice because I give this document to all of my department heads um, so that every day they can, you know, open their iPad or their phone, go to page three because they know they're shooting scene three and you know, be able to read the sides, be able to look at the shots, um, be able to look at the location, time of day, sun path, uh, you know, any reference photos I've taken, any inspiration photos I've taken. Um, and then I note like specialty gear. I know I make other notes, like general notes, um, like here it says, this should feel like a major journey and epic long, day long pilgrimage. You know, these are little things that when you're in the dreaming phase with in prepping with your director, it's really easy to remember. But when you're on set and shit is just moving fast and you're just trying to blaze through shots, it's really nice to have these little reminders of why you're there and what you're doing um, that are a little bit heavier, more conceptual. Hmm. And uh, do you, so do you, have you been doing your own operating up until now? Um, yeah, for the most part, I operated on this film. Um, you know, I mostly do single camera projects. So for me, it's never really been an issue there, you know, there'll be times where we have multiple cameras and I'll bring in multiple operators so that I can watch um, both cameras, but I really enjoy being by the camera uh, for better or worse. I think the advantage of being by the camera is that I'm really on set and I'm by the actors and I, you know, I, I try to develop really strong relationships with the actors I work with. I think that's really important that they trust me and understand my vision as much as I understand theirs so that we can work together. Because, you know, a lot of times we're doing things, but I'm doing things with the director that are like, honestly kind of confusing or don't make, you know, don't make sense or are really challenging, you know, or I'll, we'll be trying, we'll be attempting a shot many times and the actor's like, I've nailed this performance. Why the fuck are we still shooting this? And I, I have to explain to them my vision and, and help them understand why we need to work together to continue to shoot. So when I'm on set and I'm right by the camera and I can feel the actors breathing and I can see them, I can really take the te their temperature and see how, how they're feeling about the scene, you know, sense where they are. When I'm behind a monitor 30 feet away from the actors, I feel very distant and I feel, you know, it's, it's hard for me. I, I, I struggle with it because I really, I, I love being able to hear the director call cut, look at what, you know, look up from the camera and just my first, the first thing I always do is look at the actors and I look at how they felt about that take. Cause you can tell instantly, you can tell if they felt like they nailed it or you can tell if they feel like they need one more. And that's something that like, even as a director, you don't always get to see. And so I think that's really special. So I, I really love being on set. I love being with an earshot. I love hearing it, you know, the whispers, the, the, the size, everything that you get. It's, it's very, it's so much more visceral. And I really, I really love that about being an operator, but um, I think it's also important to learn how to work with operators as a DP, because there, there are times where you're shooting with multiple cameras and you really need to be sitting with the director at the monitor and watching multiple monitors. Um, mm. I just don't do that as often. Yeah, it's it's something I've been thinking about and talking with a lot of people is obviously the situation we're in is going to cause the way we work to change. And, you know, it was feeling like we were heading in a weird direction already because you would go on set and you would see people way over in the other corner looking at monitors, nowhere near camera, focus pullers are further and further mm -hmm. away. Yeah. And obviously now it's probably going to be mandatory that there's less people around the camera and less people with the actors. And it's, uh, totally. it's going to be interesting to see if that really changes the vibe on set, you know? And yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. It's, it, it's interesting to say, I think one thing that it will do is, you know, there will be more people offset, but I think that the people that are on set will be the essential people. And I think that's interesting because I do think that there's this awkward phase right now where I'll be on set and I'll look around and there's like 15 monitors and there's like, you know, half the people are looking at them, half of them are, the people are sort of spaced out. Some people are like watching a monitor on their phone. Like it's just, it's a little less focused and it's a little spread out. So I think that there might actually be some good that comes out of this that we're really just streamlining who's on set because, um, because there are so many monitors, people just sort of stumble on set and it's, it, it gets a little messy sometimes. So yeah, I'll be interested to see how this evolves. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a there's a very direct question about the scene where uh, a kid throws a rock, and mm -hmm. then you've got a POV of the rock flying, and they want to ask yeah. how you achieve that. <laughs> um, Mark, maybe you can go through that that PDF again and find that scene. I think we we saw it yesterday when we were going through it. 
But um, that was a scene that, that was a shot that Joe had always wanted. And it was a shot that um, I didn't, I couldn't really crack. I was having a really hard time with it. And this goes back to this idea of, you know, setting your crew up for success. And, you know, I tried to dig into the most difficult things I could imagine for the film. And I planted those seeds in my department heads, heads as soon as possible. You know, one of the first things I said to Jason, my key grip, key grip was I have this shot that I have no idea how to pull off. And it, this was like, the, you know, the first day that I met him when we were, I hadn't even hired him yet. And so I really just planted the seed early and he started to think of things and mock things up and we both separately were brainstorming. Um, but what was really cool is that at a certain point, I realized I could trust Jason and Jason was like, I'll figure this out, don't worry about it. And it was really great that I was able to plant that seed early. But basically what he did was he created this um, huge like trebuchet catapult thing on, you know, it was 40 feet of triangular steel truss um, on a pendulum and uh, we mounted the Alexa Mini to it, just totally stripped of all the accessories, put an eight millimeter lens on there. Um, and we had like six or eight grips uh, basically operating the thing. And it just was a big 40 foot arm that just swung in the air, arced through the air. And then, uh, you know, they caught it before it hit our little kid actor. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it was, it was really incredible to see them pull it off and to pull it off kind of without a hitch and incredibly safely. It was really awesome. <laughs> that's very cool yeah you can see a little <laughs> yeah, you can see my little drawing this is a there's a little piece of a little this is all i gave jason i think and this was like you know this was my rough idea of it and he this was after a few discussions and i obviously it looks pretty simple and stupid but it was actually you know pretty difficult to to pull off uh, just because of how high we wanted to get the camera and also the location we were in was this deserted dock area that was super sketchy and didn't have any level ground so uh, and you know <laughs> little kids running around so it was wild <laughs> very cool and um and then onward to uh euphoria so you came into the show towards the end there was already a mm -hmm. few other dps that had been working on it marcel red yep. um uh, drew daniels he shot an episode or two before you as well and, yep yep um but you came in and did the last two episodes. And I think that's, mm -hmm. uh, that must've been uh, quite, uh, quite daunting. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of, it was wild. I mean, up, up to that point, I hadn't really considered working in television seriously. I mean, I was interested in it, but it was, uh, it was something that it wasn't something that I thought a lot about or aspired to particularly. I was really happy working in uh, the film world, and, you know, creating these kind of singular film experiences. So going into Euphoria, I was, I wouldn't say I was skeptical, but I was, I was a bit intimidated and daunted by taking on such a huge production so late in the game. You know, by the time I came in, I think they had been shooting for like eight months or more. Mm -hmm. um, so it was weird to be the new kid a little bit, uh, but fortunately the crew was incredible and really dialed in. And Sam, the director, writer, showrunner producer was uh you know just so inspired and really pushed everyone to do amazing work so that really helped but um yeah it was weird because i wanted to bring my own vision and my own style and my own inspiration to it but um you know i also had to honor what had already been done and i was worried that that was going to be difficult but fortunately it just it felt that i felt really effortless and sam created a really amazing space for me to kind of push my own ideas and create a dialogue so it was really fun. You know, we got to do these scenes on 16 millimeter um, and we got to shoot a lot on film. We got to, you know, we got to shoot some new locations that were, hadn't been in the series yet. And so I was able to kind of totally design the lighting for those scenes, which was really fun because a lot of the locations kind of already had lighting designed for them. Uh, so I was able to kind of sneak in my own inspirations. And fortunately, you know, part of the reason I took the project in the first place was because of the people that came before me. Uh, Marcel and Drew are just are really incredible and uh, I knew that you know they were going to be inspiring people to follow after mm. and they they had quite a very interesting and eclectic camera package you mentioned they had 16 millimeter but also um, 35 millimeter film and all sorts yeah. of different format digital cameras and yeah I'm curious yeah, as I mean, to how that was used yeah I mean we mostly shot on the Alexa 65 um and one thing sam was really interested in was just kind of always seeing how we could evolve the look of the show and the feel of it you know 
on my first meeting with Sam, you know, I was really concerned with sort of selling myself to him and convincing him that I was capable of the job and that I could do it. And it was really funny because the whole sort of interview conversation I had with him, he was just picking my brain on how I could, thought we could make the show better. And I kind of took me, I was kind of caught off guard by that. You know, I was, I, I came in with the assumption that I would have to sort of carry what had already been done. And he was there asking me how I could push it and, you know, elevate it and take it to the next level. And so, you know, I brought as many ideas as we could. And we talked about different ways to mix different mediums in. And, you know, they had already been shooting some 35 millimeter on the show, which I was really excited about. And we started shooting a lot more 35. And after getting the dailies back, um, you know, we, we loved them, but we felt like it didn't feel different enough from the Alexa 65. So we started shooting more 16 millimeter. Um, and Sam was showing me references of like old 90s, uh, you know, um, cop dramas that he loved. And so I was like, we should just shoot on 16 millimeter. And so we started shooting on 16 and we, get, we were getting the dailies back and, you know, we'd be sitting at the monitors and our DIT would put up the dailies on, you know, the 16 millimeter dailies. And like everyone on the cast and crew would just swarm the monitors and just be freaking out about how much they loved the way they looked, you know, way more than they ever did with the Alexa. <laughs> so it was like cool to, I think for them, it was just like refreshing to see something new and see this, see the show in a new light. So, you know, we mixed, we tried to mix in film wherever we could. Cool. There's a question about a specific effect, um, a disappearing wall in one of the episodes and how you achieved that. Disappearing wall. Which episode is that? I'm not sure which one that was either. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I, I know what it is. Um, so, yeah, there was a, um, this was Sam's idea. It's So, there's this movie called, I think it's called One from the Heart, um, yeah. which is an amazing movie. And they do this thing with um, theatrical scrims where they print the image of the set on a theatrical scrim and create a wall with it. So it looks like the set wall. Um, and when you light it frontally, it just appears like the wall. Uh, when you backlight it or when you put light behind it and you take the light off the front, uh, it sort of disappears. Uh, and it's a, it's a technique that's used in theater a lot, but not used in film a lot, but they used it beautifully and one from the heart. And Sam showed me this reference. And he was like, I really want to figure out a, a scene to do this. Um, and so we ended up inserting it. I think it was scene, I think it was episode 107. Um, and we were able to print two of Rue's bedroom walls on theatrical scrim uh, and kind of re we actually rebuilt her room in the school set. Uh, and then it was, there was a lot of testing. I tested a lot of different fabrics to figure out which fabric worked the best. And we did a lot of lighting tests to make it work. But um, yeah, that was a really crazy, scary shot that I honestly didn't know if we were going to be able to pull off and sell. Uh, and it was one of those shots where I, I did a lot of tests. And even after all the tests, I was like, this may or may not work. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time and money and research pulling it off. And fortunately it worked out, but it was, it was a big risk. It was scary. Hmm. So how was it working with Sam? Because like you said, he's writing, he's producing, he's directing. Um, and, you know, I'm imagining he's working on other episodes while you're yeah. prepping. So that's gotta be interesting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I loved working with Sam. It was, it took me a minute to sort of calibrate myself to his um, working style and his energy. Uh, but it was a fun, it was a fun challenge for me. Uh, I think one thing I've learned as a DP is how important it is to not try to impress upon people your style of working too, too, uh, too aggressively. You know, there's a reason why I work with people, and I think I have to sort of honor that and respect that, and understand, you know, respect respect a director's process. And I think it's a collaborative thing, but I always try to try to respect their energy and how they like to work. And with Sam, you know, he's very spontaneous, um, and he his he knows exactly what he wants, and he knows what he loves. And he, if he sees something, he knows that he knows whether he likes it or not. But you know, he doesn't always communicate it verbally or on paper so one thing that was really challenging is we didn't shot list at all for the entire shoot um i think there was one scene that we shot listed only because we were losing daylight or we were losing night and it was the sun was going to rise and i kind of drug sam by the ear and told him we had to shot list this scene if we were going to cover it uh, but other than that you know we would show up every day talk through the scenes look at them with the actors and then sam and i would just 
uh, come up with shots. And sometimes we would just start out with a shot and not know what the next shot was going to be. Um, you know, and halfway through a shot, Sam might be like, move the camera this way, move the camera that way. And this is something I was not used to at all. And it was really intimidating and kind of crazy. Um, and it made me kind of go nuts, but, um, it ended up being this like really incredible magical experience. And I think it's what made the show what it is, is that, you know, we were really just like flying by the seat of our pants at all times. And I think what's important to remember, like what was important was to understand the, and it just goes back to this idea of energy and vibe, just like, if you understand the energy and the vibe of what the director is trying to do, it's sort of your job as a DP, production designer, costume designer, grip, anybody, set dresser, to just understand that vibe and do things without asking, without them asking to be done, you know, and to just understand someone's vision and just help realize it. <laughs> That's pretty wild. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was it was insane. I mean, it was it, it was like an enormous learning experience for me, and it was really difficult and kind of terrifying at times. But it also helped that I just had like maybe the you know one of the best crews in the world, and just people that were so talented and uh, had such an incredible attitude that really, really, really helped. There's a question about the final scene and um, being able to capture the color. Um, there's a lot going on there. You know, there's a huge choreography uh, between the camera and the actors and, um, and then some pretty big lighting cues too, by the looks of it. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the final scene was, you know, it was another one of those things that like that scene wasn't written until like a couple of weeks before we shot it. Um, or like maybe like three weeks before we shot it. Um, Sam was trying to figure out how to end the season. And he, I think he always knew it was going to be something like this, but, you know, with Sam, I think he was always developing stuff in his head and he would give hints to it, but we would have to sort of pull it out of him and draw it out and flesh it out. Um, and, uh, you know, we talked a lot about it and we were able to find an incredible choreographer, Ryan Heffington, who, you know, built this insane choreography. Um, and Sam really wanted it to feel theatrical. He wanted everything to be lit up. So we, you know, I figured the only way we were able to do this was to shoot on a back lot. So we shot at the Disney, the Disney ranch, um, which gave us access to all these houses. I mean, we spent the grip, grip and electric team spent four or five days pre-lighting the set. I think we had, you know, I gave you guys a lighting diagram, but that was my preliminary lighting diagram. And I think we doubled or tripled the amount of lights we had. I think we used like over 120 lights on this scene. Um, and most of them were wirelessly controlled, which was just wild. Um, but yeah, we, you know, this was the only scene in the entire, in my entire experience on the show where Sam did not comment on the lighting, which I was really proud about. And it's because I just went all out. <laughs> I think every single scene I would light, Sam would walk in and he'd be like, it's good, but like, you can do better. You can do more here. You can like push it to that next level. And so I think kind of, a, you know, I, with this last scene, I just used every single light I possibly could. And uh, you used a lot of gels and then we also used a lot of LED lighting to pump out color. Wow. That's, <laughs> it's really crazy. Yeah, I think we're going to, I think we're going to bring up the, uh, the lighting design um, overhead cool. as well. So we can see that. Cool. But was it a, was it a, a mix of all different lighting HMI? Yeah, LED? it was. I really love mixing all types of lighting because I think everything gives you a different quality. And I think that it's really cool to see how different lights hit people's face differently and hit the space differently. But, um, you know, I, we, we basically surrounded the entire area with hard lighting, whether that was big maxi roots, um, 18 K HMIs, um, down to smaller 1.8 K HMIs, uh, S360 sky panels. Um, I don't know. I feel like we use just about every type of light out there. And then in the houses, we use sky panels to sort of glow them. Um, and then we had soft boxes on condors that could kind of move with us as we were shooting. Um, so we had, I think, like an 8 by 8 and a 12 by 12 um, soft box with sky panel led sky panels that the gaffer danny durr was controlling remotely so he could shift color or shift brightness on them and then of, of course like all the um all the street we installed all the street lights ourselves and put our own tungsten lights in them so that we could adjust the brightness and 
place them exactly where we wanted to place them. And there was a lot of, there were a lot of times where the camera would be moving on a crane or there'd be wires that would cast shadows. So Danny would be dimming down those lights as the camera moved through that area. And then they would dim back up um, so that you would never miss a beat, but it also, the camera also would cast a shadow, things like that. So everything was really, really choreographed. But at the same time, we were also always kind of playing jazz and it was really fluid. So, you know, Danny would have to be, you know, really working on the fly. Um, and fortunately, like the technology is so advanced right now that you can do that. That's incredible. And I saw at least two cameras, you know, rolling simultaneously. Were there more? Um, there were two cameras. I don't know that we used this. I think I would say maybe there's one shot from B camera in that entire sequence, but I think almost every single mm -hmm. shot in that sequence ended up being from a camera on the crane. Um, and that's just the way Sam and I think, you know, like, I don't, you know, we're not really interested in getting a lot of coverage as much as we are like evolving a shot. You know, it's, yeah, I was telling you yesterday, it's like we, I tried to pull stills from the show, but like a still never really says a lot from this show because every shot is always evolving and moving. And we always tried to think of it that way, you know, it's instead of getting a separate angle with a different camera it was always about um, moving the camera to evolve the, evolve the story or the plot. Um, and oftentimes the B camera was being used by the second unit DP to shoot something else or uh, to help set up for the next scene. I really like, we, we really tried to avoid doing like any standard coverage of anything. Gotcha. How, how, um, how much involved are you in picking out the actual technology used as far as lighting goes? That's one of the questions. Is it, do you leave it up to the gaffer or do you, are you very specific about, I want an 18 K here and I want a sky panel 360 here? Uh, I think it depends on who I'm working with um, and my sort of comfort level with them. You know, as a, as a DP, we end up traveling around and working in a lot of different places and, you know, I'll end up working with crew that I've never worked with really often. And so with them, I often sort of, fall back on my go-to fixtures and I'll request certain lights. Um, with Danny, it was funny, like at the beginning of my collaboration with Danny on the show, you know, I would ask for a specific light and he would just sort of nod his head and then show up with a different light that worked better. <laughs> <laughs> and like, you know, what I realized very quickly is that like a good gaff or a good key grip, they just want, they want to know the end result. They don't need to know the exact fixture. And there will be times where I will request a specific fixture um, you should stay on this photo for a second. That's a mm -hmm. good one. Um, but uh, there's a t there'll be times where I will request specific fixtures just because I know why I need them and I don't need to explain it to him. But um, in general, like uh, I try to leave that up to the people I'm working with to to make those decisions. And like you know, there are certain times where I'll have an idea and I'll ask for something specific. But um, you know, once you get into a rhythm with someone, they really tend to just anticipate what you need. Uh, and like, this is, this is an example of something I would never do except on Euphoria, which is put like two 4K HMIs on a train platform and just point them at the camera. Um, <laughs> this is something that like, you know, when we first started scouting this and looking at it, Sam was like, it's nice, but like, it just doesn't have that, like, you know, he would always do this. He would always just be like, it's good, but like, it just needs, and for him, it was like, it always just needs that something. It needs that little extra like kick and you know, so I would always have lights in my back pocket. And, you know, I actually had those lights because I knew something like that was coming. I had some lights like way down at the end of the platform ready to go in a generator. And I think Danny had it all ready to set up. So we just like kind of, you know, as a joke, I turned these on. And I was like, is that good enough for you? And he's like, that's perfect. And I, I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> okay, now I actually have to use those. So <laughs> there's a lot, there was a lot of that on this show. <laughs> and how did you um how did you collaborate with the other dps um did you guys meet did you talk about what they were doing or did you just kind of come in blind uh i don't i wouldn't say i came in blind i didn't i didn't get a chance to talk to marcel because he was gone by the time i got there and uh, i talked to drew a bit but he was so busy on set that i kind of i did set visits and i really just watched um but, you know, I watched, I was watching cuts of episodes. I was understanding what they were after. And I understood the general sort of tone and vibe of the show. So, and the tools they were using. So I think there was, there was sort of a motivation for me to not 
pay too much attention to what was done before me. I think it was about like honoring those things that had been done, but then just kind of moving it along and progressing it. Uh, so there wasn't a ton of discussion. There were moments where I had to, you know, because I was the last DP, I was picking up shots for other older episodes. And so I would pick their brains for what they had done or what they think I should do. Um, and I did, I did learn a lot from Drew and Marcel about, you know, how they worked and how, how the show ran. But, um, you know, we all kind of just did our thing. Hmm. Okay. That's cool. On the side, you've been also shooting uh, documentaries and music videos and mm -hmm. all sorts of different projects. And I'm, I'm curious, um, why, what is it that drives you to do those projects as well? Um, well, I love music videos because I love music and I love getting to work with musicians. And I think that's really special and unique. Um, and it's like a way to give back to an industry that's given me so much. And I also think it's just like a great way to experiment and explore. I also work with new directors. Um, and uh, yeah, I just, I mean, I love, I just love the, I love the energy surrounding a music video um, and how fast it is. And, how you're able to just kind of throw something on the wall and see what sticks. Uh, and as far as documentaries go, I just love the opportunity to have a camera in my hand with a really small crew and just make something really intentional and thoughtful and bring a lot of my filmmaking skills, my narrative filmmaking skills to the documentary world. And I think that's so special and so unique. And I've, I've actually just, I just wrapped a feature like documentary that I'm hoping will come out uh, in the next year, that's going to be pretty amazing. And it was just, you know, a lot of the times it was just me with the camera, me and the director and the subject with the camera. And it's, I don't know, it's just magic to be able to, to go back to that. You know, it's so, it's so rare to have that experience where I'm just able to take a camera and shoot something and not have a million people staring over my shoulder and not have a million people coming on the set and tweaking things, you know, it's just to, just to find compositions and, and work with, you know, dance with the, with the subject. Hmm. That's very cool. There's, there's a lot of, I can tell students and young filmmakers uh, on with us today and they're asking some really cool questions that you let's know, hear I'm it. sure we get to here before. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so um, the, there's one asking advice for an aspiring DP looking to get their foot in the door. And um, when the productions do start up again, what, what would your advice to them be? Um, I don't know. My, my advice to everyone I think that has asked me for advice is, uh, is to just keep making things and not be too precious. Um, I think that's that's something that we all struggle with is this idea that like whatever we make has to be the perfect calling card for who we are and what we believe in and what we want to be making. Um, and so I see a lot of people who are like, I want to make stuff, but I don't have exactly the camera I want, or I don't, I don't have the perfect idea yet. And for me, it's just, you know, I, I can completely relate to that. And no matter where you are in your career, you will always feel that way. I'm always unsatisfied with where I'm at. I always want to be at the next level. And you'll find that any deep, any like, any DP is going to feel that way. And everyone's going to be wishing they were on that next bigger project. So I think part of it is just doing the work and just continuing to create things and being scrappy. And, you know, some of my, the projects I'm most proud of are projects that I just grabbed a camera and shot by myself. You know, like I was telling you guys, we didn't talk about it today, but there was a short film I did that um, was supposed to be a South by Southwest this year. Um, and I played on Amazon for a few days, streamed on Amazon for a few years, for a few days. But um, we shot that on 35 millimeter with like, you know, a three person crew. Um, and it was all handheld. The whole, the whole short film is one shot, you know, and it's with basically a bunch of non-actors. Yeah, Run On is the name of the film. And um, that's, I'm, I'm more proud of that project than like 90% of the stuff I've shot in the last couple of years. Um, so I think what I'm trying to get at is that like, you just need to keep creating things and surround yourself with people that um, have similar values and beliefs as you and will push you to create things, you know? And for me, one thing I did as a DP was try to surround myself with other directors, like just my colleagues who are wanting to make stuff and just try to help each other make things. Like if a director has a project, try to help produce it. Like I would, I'll help produce any, any, any project I believe in. I'm, I will help produce that project if I can in any way, you know, it's, you have to be creative. And I think especially post you know, post all of this bullshit, I think uh, we just need to all be supportive of each other and be really scrappy and smart about how we create things. Mm. 
Very cool. And um, as we get, I can't believe we're coming up on an hour already. It's, it's gone by oh, so it's fast, crazy. but uh, <laughs> I'd love to hear kind of what you are uh, hoping to do next. You know, what's the, what's the next step for you? Um, well, I had just started prepping a TV show with Amazon that was going to be in Canada. I was four days into the prep when I was sent home. So uh, we're currently trying to figure out what the next steps are for that show. Um, which I'm really excited about. Uh, beyond that, I'm working on, you know, we're working on finishing this documentary that I worked on and I have a handful of music related projects that uh, are either in post-production or pre-production and hopefully we'll be shooting more soon. So trying to keep the little projects going while, while waiting for the longer term projects to kick back into gear. So just trying to stay busy. Cool. I really appreciate the time today, Adam. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was awesome. It was great thanks, to guys. see you and uh, yeah. hopefully we'll talk soon. Sounds good. And thank you to everybody that joined us today. Um, please join us again next week on Wednesday. We're going to be sitting down and talking with producer Jamie Buckner and uh, hear some fun stories from that side of the world. Our episodes will also be available on our website, airyrental.com, where you can also check out all of our unique and exciting products that we offer. And you can follow us on youtube.com forward slash airy rental group. And until next time, everyone, cheers.